Do you have it now? Let me read it to you. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 to verse 7. Now I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in His kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. They are being tested by many troubles, and they are very poor. But they are also filled with abundant joy, which has overflowed in rich generosity. For I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more. And they did it for their own, of their own free will. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift for the believers in Jerusalem. They even did it more than we had hoped, for their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and to us, just as God wanted them to do. So we have urged Titus, who encouraged your giving in the first place, to return to you and encourage you to finish this ministry of giving. Since you excel in so many ways, in your faith, your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, and your love from us, I want you to excel also in this gracious act of giving. As I said earlier, today is our Mission Sunday. It's a time for us to pledge our financial support to our missionaries and mission works in Cambodia. Let us pray, Father. I just want to commit the sharing to your hands. Let your anointing be upon me. Let your anointing be upon your word and upon your people as I share, O oh God. Open our hearts and receive your word with gladness in Jesus' name. Amen. I believe in the power of giving. I believe there is power when we give. There is a story about a man who had a heart attack and was rushed to the hospital. He was not allowed to have many visitors, you know, fearing that the excitement might not be good for him. While he was in the hospital, a rich uncle died and left him a million dollars. His family wondered how to break the news to him with the least amount of excitement or else he dies. It was decided later on to ask the preacher if he would go and break the news quietly to the man. So the preacher went and gradually led up to the question, the preacher asked the patient what he would do if he inherited a million dollars. He said, the patient said, I think I would give half of it to the church. The preacher dropped dead. Powerful. <laughs> At the end of his earthly ministry, Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, even so send I you. You and I are God's chosen laborers to reach the world for Christ. We are God's instruments through which He wants to show His love, grace, and mercy. It is this church, it is us, who have been called at this time to carry on the work of the Lord. And as we go about the work, we have to bear in mind these two fields of labor. Number one is the infield. What is this infield? It is the local field for which we are personally responsible. No amount of money will harvest this field, for it is in the local field that you and I must roll up our sleeves and do the work. This infield I'm referring to is our local church, Evangel Tabernacle Iloilo. This is our infield. We work here. No other people can work here except us. But then, there is another field of labor in which we cannot work. That is the second field. I call it the outfield. It is the field that lies outside of our church. The field that you and I cannot harvest, but to which God has called men to go and do His work. This is the field where God has placed our missionaries, Pastor Edgar and Rowena, and Pastor Mike and Juvie. Though we cannot work, we cannot work on these fields, God gives us the privilege of helping our missionaries as they carry out the work. And we join together in that privilege by means of giving in faith. Today, I would like to entitle my sharing the epitome of giving in dark times. Epitome means a person that is a perfect example. 
So a perfect example of giving in dark times. And my three points today are, number one, understanding giving. Number two, the resistance to giving. And number three, Jesus, the epitome of giving. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, that the gospel of God's kingdom will be preached throughout all the world as a witness unto Him. The gospel of the kingdom is about the kingdom of God. It is about the reign of God. It is about the triumph of Jesus over sin, death, judgment, over Satan, guilt, and over fear. And it is the good news. Over and over, the Bible declares that God does what He does so that His name might be proclaimed in all the earth, like Cambodia, which has been in spiritual darkness, so that the people there might see His light. Isaiah 9.2 says, The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a, deep, in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. So let me take you to my first point, and that is understanding giving. Before we can give, we should understand what is giving. As Christians, there are five truths we need to understand about giving. First, giving is expected from believers. Jesus said this to His disciples. Take note. Matthew 6, 2, He said, When you give, not if you give. I repeat, He said, When you give, and not if you give. Christian giving is not optional, but rather essential. We often hear people say this, in the Old Testament, they had to give. But in the New Testament, like now, we only give if we want to. That's what they say. But this is clearly not the teaching of Jesus. He expected all His followers to be givers and we should give willingly. Second truth, give for the right reasons. Jesus warned His disciples not to give for the sake of being admired by men. He said this in Matthew 6, 1, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. When we give, we must be careful to examine our motives. We ought to give for the glory of God and the good of His people. We must desire His approval, God's approval of our giving, rather than the praise and admiration of people. Third truth, our giving is ultimately to the all-seeing heavenly Father. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 3-4, When you give, your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. That means when we give, we are not simply adding to the church budget. We are giving up a thank offering to the Father. Thus, we must all give us unto the Lord. When we give, we must give us unto the Lord. For our ultimate goal in giving is to please God. Fourth truth, giving should be done in light of the incarnation of Christ. You know, many Christians today argue about whether the tithe or the 10% of, of income is still the standard of our, of our giving to the church. Damo gaba is. Disputants usually want to show that Less than 10% is fine. They say if you give 5%, it's okay. But Paul corrects the whole debate in one verse. He says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sake He became poor, so that through His poverty, you might become rich. 2 Corinthians 8.9 It means Christ's self-giving is the standard talaksan of our giving. We begin from the base of tithe and aim for emulation of His self-sacrifice. Our giving is to be inspired and instructed by Christ's inexpressible gift. The fifth truth, the liberality of God's blessings to us is connected to the liberality of our giving. Though it may, seems, it may seem strange, but both Jesus and Paul 
emphasize that there is a relation between our giving to the Lord and the Lord's giving to us. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 9, 6, Now this I say, He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Jesus reminds us in Matthew 6, 4, that our reward in giving comes from our heavenly Father. As someone has said, the desire to be generous and the means to be generous come, both come from God. What is the application for this truth? Giving is essential if you want to be like Christ. Our motive should be examined if we want to honor and glorify God. He who sows sparingly will reap also sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. We must come, we all must come to a point that when we give, we give us unto the Lord, for He is the one who will reward us. In this passage of, of Scripture that we are reading, actually, Paul was rebuking the Corinthian church, but he was praising the Macedonian churches. The attitude of the Corinthian Christians towards giving was not according to his expectation. While the Macedonian churches insisted, they insisted on giving, the Corinthian church resisted giving. And this problem persists among many Christians today. So the greatest resistance to giving is not going to be Satan. It's not Satan. It is not going to be lack of money. It is not lack of money. It is not going to be a bad job or your spouse. Our greatest resistance today is ourselves. It is ourselves. And that is my second point, the resistance to giving. Resistance to giving. How do we become our own resistance? How do we resist? Practically, when we close our wallet. That's number one. We resist by closing our wallet. Nobody else control your money. Am I right? It is you who plans when and where to give. It is you who decides how much and how often to give. Have you heard of this story of the pastor who stood and spoke before his congregation about giving? Maybe no? I'll tell you. He said to his congregation, Folks, brothers and sisters, today I have good news and I also have bad news. Which do you want to hear first? The people responded, The good news first, pastor. So the pastor said, The good news is that we all have we have all the money we need to do. We need to do the work of God. That means the pastor said, we have all the money we need to do the work of God. So upon hearing, the congregation applauded. Oh, they were so happy that we, they have the money. So they asked, what's the bad news, pastor? The pastor replied, the bad news is that the money is all in your wallets. Paul told the Corinthian church, abound in this grace also. What grace is that? He tells us in 2 Corinthians 8.2 that in spite being tested by many troubles, and they are very poor, the Macedonian churches are also filled with abundant joy, which has overflowed in rich generosity. In other words, their abundant joy and deep poverty abounded or burst forth in great quantity to their rich generosity. Even though they appeared to have nothing to offer, they were generously giving. Many Christians today appear to have plenty. We look so good outside, but we offer sparingly. We offer little. We Secondly, we become our own resistance when we move in faithlessness. What would move a people who have nothing to give? What would move a people to have, who have nothing, they don't have anything, but they give so generously? It is faith. 
Faith enables them. The Macedonian believers had that kind of faith that the Corinthians didn't. I want to read to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 9 to verse 16. It's in the screen, it's on the screen. This is what Paul says to this church. And I am not trying to scare you with my letters. Some of you are saying Paul's letters are harsh and powerful, but in person, he is a weakling and has nothing worth saying. Those people had better understand that when I am with you, I will do exactly what I say in my letters. We don't dare compare ourselves with those who think so much of themselves, but they are foolish to compare themselves with themselves. We won't brag about something we don't have, we don't have a right to brag about. We will only brag about the work that God has sent us to do, and you are part of that work. We are not bragging more than we should. After all, we did bring the message about, the message about Christ to you. We don't brag about what others have done as if we had done those things ourselves. But I hope that as you, come, as, as you become stronger in your faith, we will, be able, you, we will be able to reach many more of the people around you. That has always been our goal. Then we will be able to preach the good news in other lands where we cannot take credit for work somebody, someone else has already done. You know, many Christians love to quote this passage from themselves, which is found in Philippians chapter 4, verse 9. This is one of the most favorite scripture verse of many Christians. And what is that? And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of His glory in Jesus Christ. In other translation, and my God shall supply all your needs according to His riches in glory in Jesus Christ. But they use this part of Scripture out of context because they do not really understand how this promise came about. This promise of meeting all your needs is not applied to all the Christians. Let me repeat. This promise of meeting, God meeting all your needs is not applied to all the Christians. Paul only said this to the Christians at Philippi because they have been giving. Paul was in prison and they sent gifts to Paul. So Paul was confident that God would meet their needs because they were generous in their giving. This is not a promise of wealth or even an easy life. Rather, the concept of need has to be considered according to God's will. What we need and what we want are not always the same thing. That being said, God will bless those who will use the resources they have according to His purpose. This is something Paul observed, specifically happening with the Philippians. Their needs would be met through Christ, the one who made and controlled all things. They would never lack with Christ as their provider. You know, from the earliest pages of Scripture, God has been known as the Lord who will provide in Genesis 20 to 14, and also affirmed by Peter in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 11, as noted by Paul in 2 Corinthians 9, 10, which says, He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed of for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You know, the truth is this. Our needs are not met simply because the empowerment for supply is not present. What is that empowerment for supply? Giving in faith. Because we do not give in faith, our needs are not met. Third resistance, we become our own resistance when our hearts are not willing. The Macedonian believers were suffering from great poverty at the time. These Christians were already in financial straits due to persecution and exclusion. In a series of earthquakes and crop failures, forced them into even deeper poverty. However, in spite of their poverty, they willingly collected offerings to aid their Christian friends in Jerusalem. Paul was so moved by their love and willing hearts 
that he taught every church he formed to establish the same form of missionary giving. Here, Paul is scolding the Corinthian church because they were the first church to promise their offerings, but they were not giving those offerings. Though they had the resources to do something, they lacked willing hearts. And on the other hand, though the churches of Macedonia were lacking in resources, they had willing hearts. Why the Corinthian church did not have a willing heart? Why did they move in faithlessness and as a result, they did not give? What is the reason for that? Fear of not, of not having enough. Fear of not having enough. In the Old Testament, there is a record where Moses was preparing the people of Israel to build the tabernacle of God. When the time came to finance the work, God instructed Moses in Exodus 25, 2-8. It says, Tell the people of Israel to bring me their sacred offerings. Accept contributions from all those whose hearts are moved to offer them, those hearts who are willing. Here is a list of sacred things, sacred offerings you may accept from them. Gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, fine linen and goat hair for cloth, tanned ramskins, and so on. Okay, you can read it there. And he continued, have the people of Israel build me a holy sanctuary so I can live among them. And in Exodus chapter 36, verse 5 to 7, it is also recorded, they went to Moses and reported, the people have given more than enough materials to complete the job the Lord has commanded us to do. So Moses gave the command, and this message was sent throughout the camp. Men and women don't prepare any more gifts for the sanctuary. We have enough. So the people stopped bringing their sacred offerings. Their contributions were more than enough to complete the whole project. We can clearly see here that all Israel took part in the building of the tabernacle. They gave what was in their hands in order to build a dwelling place for God. But what made the Israelites willing to give? What caused them to give so much so easily? The reason is found in Exodus chapter 12, verse 35 to 36. And the people of Israel did as Moses had instructed. They asked the Egyptians for clothing and, and articles of silver and gold. The Lord caused the Egyptians to look favorably on the Israelites. And they gave the Israelites whatever, whatever they asked for. So they stripped the Egyptians of their wealth. This happened when they were leaving Egypt. They took all the things from the Egyptians. So the Israelites were willing to give because of their abundance. They gave because they had so much substances to give. They gave from the loot of the Egyptians. Does this sound familiar when it comes to giving? To our giving? People are willing to give as long as there is abundance. As long as their pockets are full. And as long as there is more to come. But as we look at our situation and circumstances today in the natural man, our hearts are melting in fear. The main reason for our unwillingness to give, like the church in Corinth, is because of the fear of not having enough. We tend to focus on the immediate need and we worry before the clock strikes. The nature of the fallen man dominates and every circumstance frightens us. This kind of fear short circuits our willingness, shakes our faith, and shrinks our, shrinks our giving. What's the application for this? The fear of not having enough during this pandemic, when our income is small and limited, can make it very difficult for us to have a willing heart to give, move in faith, and open our wallets. But it is also possible that in spite being tested by many troubles and being very poor, we can, we can be filled with abundant joy which can overflow in rich generosity. In short, we can be generous even if we are not rich. This brings us to our third point, Jesus, the epitome of giving. Throughout generations, God has proven Himself faithful in providing for His children. To give you a few examples, God provided an ark to save Noah and his family. He gave Abraham a son in his old age. He provided a ram to save Isaac. 
He protected the people of Israel in the land of Egypt. He gave the land of Canaan to Jacob and his children as inheritance, and many more. Finally, he gave his own son to die on the cross for our sins. It was not easy for the father to give his son, but he willingly did it. Willingly means showing that you are delighted to do something if it is needed. That is the meaning of willingly. It indicates that someone does something because he wants to, not because someone has asked that person or forced him to do it. The Macedonian church is the epitome of giving among all the churches which Paul had planted. They gave, in, they gave in spite of their lack. In fact, they insisted on giving. They were not fearful in giving because they have tasted the grace of God. All of us have tasted the grace of God. But there is someone who is the ultimate epitome of giving, ultimate example of giving. The word epitome, as I said here, refers to a person who possesses to a high degree the grace of giving. The Macedonian church gave out of their want, which is money. But Jesus, the Son of God, gave His life in order to redeem us. Jesus exhibited the highest degree in the area of giving sacrificially, willingly, and fearlessly by dying on the cross for us. Though He was rich, He became poor for us. Why did He leave His rich and glorious heaven and come as a poor man? Why was he born in a poor manger and not in a classy hospital? This is because the greatest fear of mankind is poverty. Man is afraid to be poor and bankrupt. And why do we study and work so hard? It is because we do not want to end up living a life of poverty for the rest of our lives. The main motivation in aiming for a good life is to avert this greatest fear, which is poverty. That's why we study. That's why we work. We, because we don't want to be poor. Therefore, Jesus came and embodied our fear of poverty by being born poor, living as a poor man, and even dying as a poor man. He did not own a grave after he died, but he had to be buried in a borrowed tomb. And why did he die poor? So that we can be rich. He lived out our greatest fear so that we don't have to live in the fear of poverty. He took the curse of our poverty so that we could be rich in His grace. He gave His all so that by believing in Him, we can enjoy His all. And those of us who struggle with giving are those who have failed to grasp this substitutionary death of Jesus on the cross. Truth to be told, we are all bankrupt spiritually. Truth to be told, we are poor unless God gives us His common grace to bless us with everything on this earth. We are in truth nothing. But Christ died as a poor man so that God can bless us with everything. He substituted our poverty with His death so that we can live today without fear or of this poverty. If we have grasped the totality of Christ's sacrifice for us, we would not struggle so much in giving. If we only understand His sacrifice, we will not struggle in giving. Jesus has gone through all the pain, even the ultimate pain of crucifixion and death on the cross, so, so just so to give us His salvation. So, is there anything too much for us to give in return for such an undeserving gift? To that degree, we, saw, we see how much Christ has given us. To that degree, we will give to Him. To that degree, we see Christ taking our place of poverty. To that degree, we will be released from the fear of giving. Do not let the devil, the world, or your, and your fallen nature lie to you that the more you give, the poorer you become. Our Christ gave His all, and today, no one can beat Him in His riches, which is us, His inheritance. Christ has opened up a way for us to God so that we do not have to close our wallet. He gave His life on the cross with faith in His Father to resurrect Him so that today we can give our all to Him in faith. He gave His life 
fearlessly so that we can give without the fear of becoming poorer. The resurrection of Christ stamps God's assurance that our giving will end in a triumphant note. Nothing that we give or cast upon God will return to us void. Ecclesiastes 11 says, Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Christ cast His life on the cross, and God resurrected Him with great honor, power, and glory. And so, He can do to every of our giving. I know that giving is not always easy. That's the truth. Giving is not always easy. For there are two kinds of people living today, the giver and the receiver. The receiver will not always understand the pain, the sacrifice, and the joy of, our, of true giving. Only those who truly give can understand what real giving is. I got saved at the age of 14. I gave God my heart and my soul that moment, and I felt good within me. I faithfully came to church. I paid my tithes, pledges, and gave offerings. And I believed God was happier with me. That was many years ago. Then, I gave God my talent to play for the church, which made me believe that God was more pleased with me. At the age of 19, I answered God's call to be a missionary. At 20, I, I became a full-time staff of the church. Now, I am a pastor. I thought in my heart and said, I have given my all. I have given my heart, my soul, my money, talent, service, and life. And, sa and I said, that's it. I gave all. Coming from a broken family, I have no inheritance to receive. So the best thing to do is to invest in something on our own. We saved, we spent, and invested on it for 21 years. We were looking forward to the day that we can at least have some returns on that only investment we had. But one day, we had to give it also. Three years ago, we let go of that investment for a higher purpose. That was the day when we gave our son, our only child, to be a missionary to Cambodia. He was our investment. But because he believed God called him, and he wants to serve God in Cambodia, we willingly released him. It was very painful for us at first to let him go, but we trusted God for his will, and we still trust God for his will. Now, we don't look to our son for financial or material provision. We look to God for his greater provision. We can only do it because we believe that if Jesus could give his life for us, he can give us everything we need. Now, we are happy that he is married and they have their own ministry in Cambodia. We just ask them for one thing. Give us grandchildren. We want four grandchildren. Why not? We gave God one. God will give us back four. Amen? <laughs> That's an amen to me. I want to close. The father was so pleased with Jesus for not holding back his own life, but gave it all. So God exalted him and gave him the name above all names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. Therefore, the fear of not having enough is abolished because Jesus promised in John 14, 12 to, 24, 12 to 14, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done, and even greater works, because I am going to be with the Father. You can ask for anything in my name, and I will do it, 
so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. When all is said and done, Jesus has absolute authority and power over the mission of the church. And this mission cannot fail. The Bible tells us this gospel of the kingdom, kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. Jesus also said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. John 10, 16. This mission will not fail. Amen? Shall we give the Lord a clap offering today? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord.